All right. Well, we'll go ahead and get started because um, I have a couple of announcements to begin with. Um, the first thing that everybody should know is this is being recorded. Um, so you don't have to record it yourself. It will be put onto the Transforming Communities Institute YouTube page um, within a couple of weeks of the actual presentation. So um, you don't you don't have to record yourself if you don't like want to. Um, but I am Teresa Larson. I will be the technical facilitator for this session today. Um, I work for the Transforming Communities Institute. Um, if you have any questions throughout the session, I am the person that you will want to direct those to if it is not specifically related to the presentation. Uh, you can do that either through the chat or through email. Uh, before we get started, I am going to provide the land acknowledgement from Utah State. That is, as a land-grant institution, Utah State University campuses and centers reside and operate on the territories of the eight tribes of Utah who have been living, working, and residing on this land from time immemorial. These tribes are the Confederated Tribes of the Ghost Chute Indians, Navajo Nation, Ute Indian Tribe, Northwestern Band of Shoshone, Paiute Indian Tribe of Utah, San Juan Southern Paiute, Skull Valley Band of Goshute, and White Mesa Band of the Ute Mountain Ute. We acknowledge these lands carry the stories of these nations and their struggles for survival and identity. We recognize elders past and present as peoples who have cared for and continue to care for the land. In offering this land acknowledgement, we affirm indigenous self-governance history, experiences, and resiliency of the native people who are still here today. So thank you all for joining us for this session. Um, Please ensure as we get started that your Zoom name matches any um, or matches what you would want on a continuing education certificate because that's how we track attendance. And to receive a continuing education certificate for this session, you must stay long enough to receive those credits um, as well as complete the follow-up survey that I will make available at the end of the session as well as via email in a follow-up email. Um, if you, like I said, have questions, please uh, send those to me, but I will now introduce our presenters, who are Sean Camp and uh, Susan Egbert. So Sean is an LCSW and a clinical professor of social work at Utah State University. His experience includes over 30 years of direct practice with children and adolescents, and 18 years of teaching MSW students at the University of Georgia and USU. Sean has held multiple leadership positions, including clinical supervisor, program director of an outpatient cl therapy clinic and state director of a multi-state treatment foster care agency in Georgia. Dr. Susan Cutler Egbert is an LCSW and a clinical professor of social work and the MSW program director at Utah State University. Her experience includes direct practice with children and families, child welfare research, and 25 years of teaching MSW students, firsthand at the U of U and and first at the U of U and then at USU. She is passionate about building and sustaining a competent and ethical professional workforce. So we thank them for providing this presentation and the time is now theirs until the end where I'll come back with my final announcements. Hey, welcome everyone. Um, we always see familiar names and faces in these and you, if you know us, you know, we just want to like stop everything and chat with you conversations yes. <laughs> see, how your, <laughs> see how your career's going and um <laughs> anyway please know and if you want to add things in the chat to us we'd, we'd love to read all right um so our title today is how did i end up in charge social work leadership and supervision and sean and okay. i Go ahead. we both went through graduate programs. I went to Portland State in the early 90s and I had to choose administrative track or clinical track. Of course I chose clinical track. That's what I wanted to do with my life. And, and yet there's an idea you may have heard me say before, the burden of competence or something. <laughs> Somehow a lot of us end up in leadership roles and we didn't intend to be there. So do you want to introduce Sean? 
<laughs> yeah, I had a similar kind of journey. A year out of graduate school, I suddenly found myself uh, unexpectedly and not particularly desiredly, um, desiredly? Uh, promoted into a clinical supervisor position, which at the time was shocking to me. And and I had done the same thing as Susan. U University of Georgia requires clinical administrative. Uh, and I chose clinical and had zero experience in running anything or being in charge of anyone. And so it was quite the journey. Um, and it just sort of kept going from there. I mean, in a very positive way for my career development. But <laughs> unfortunately, sometimes I think in not the best way for some of the people that I was supervising at the time, because I made a whole lot of mistakes because I had no experience and no training and no education on management or supervision. So that way it was a journey. <laughs> and the program we both teach in now at Utah State is focused on what's called an advanced generalist model, especially where we're the land grant university and serving students across the state. We um, we do train them clinically, but we also train them in leadership. And most of them are wondering why. <laughs> so <laughs> anyway, some of what we're teaching today in this workshop uh, is very much related to what we teach our students on their way out the door. Yeah. Okay. I'm trying to make the there it goes. Okay. There we go. So what we hope to accomplish, um, it's so it's our experience that relatively few social workers intend to land in leadership and administration, but maybe you did. But here we are. We land here. We had a guest speaker in our class recently who basically said. I'd had three bosses. I really didn't like how any of them led this organization. And one of my colleagues said, if you don't want another boss, you better apply. And so she did. And she's been in charge of the organization for probably 20 years. Um, so we might as well be intentional about how we lead, manage, mentor, train our employees, our colleagues, our students, and those uh, we support as they grow toward professional licensure. So we are hoping to just talk about a little bit of theory, critique several styles of leadership. Um, it'll be interesting, I think, if you haven't thought about this for a while, like there are words for that, you know? <laughs> there are, there's theory for what we see um, in organizations and communities. We wanna promote thinking about and processing of the challenges that are inherent in organizational leadership and strategies to address them. And thirdly, we want to consider the critical role that supervision plays in ethical practice and facilitate some group-based discussion and learning specifically about effective supervision in clinical settings. So, you know, it's funny, every time we talk about this topic in any, in any kind of setting or, or, or situation, I always look at the, I think about my career path and how planned and organized it looks and how so it wasn't. <laughs> And how just a sort of a rapidly just succession of challenges that that somehow I managed to meet, um, and it just looked so consistent and planned out on paper, and it just so was not in reality. So, yeah. So I feel like that as we talk about this, if if at any point we sound like we had it all together at any point, I'm speaking for myself. That was almost never true. It just is only looking backwards and in retrospect about some of the the challenges and things that. That we that I faced that got me there. So we had our own land uh, knowledge statement, which uh, we'll just skip over because uh, we, sometimes we present a lot internationally or nationally and uh, outside of Utah, obviously. So we usually have that in our PowerPoint. So we will skip over that. And one thing I want to say that we're invested in around the land grant message is, is that it's not just lip service. That yeah. we hope that everyone in our practice um, and our and our community you know, citizenship and all things that we are, we're living this acknowledgement. That's true. I mean, um, it's it's one thing to have it, which I think is a good thing, but it's another thing if you just, well, we did our part because we have a land acknowledgement statement. I, uh, we all, I always want to see that there's some action to back that up. So yeah, I agree. Okay. So, like, okay, well, so we're going to talk a little bit about what makes an effective leader. We have a clip to show. We know that across Zoom, the video gets a little sometimes, but try to just watch the video. And then in the end, we'll be sure and deliver kind of the punchline. So let's you. hope it loads up like it's supposed to. So. 
screen that it shows up on the right screen, which it doesn't like it's doing that one second. Okay, so at this moment, nobody can see this, correct? And how about now? No uh, mute. But you know, Susan can, can, can I can see that. Sorry. <laughs> All right, let's try this again. Sorry. Uh, welcome to the AGM for the Leadership Corporation. There was a lot of jogging for positions last year. Will it be the same today? I wonder. And they're off. Straight out of the box. Who is it? It's the uh, it's the finance director, the chief finance officer. Look at him go. I don't believe it. Normally he's such a quiet sort of chap, but look at him go today. And here's the, the human resources department all budding and jumping together. Now that's what I call a team, and they really are very plucky. It's the pluckiest thing you've ever seen. And here comes the CEO, uh, the marketing director must have sat beside him at the uh, last bend, various people in the room. But, and look at that, the CEO has taken the wrong direction, completely the wrong direction, but the board is totally following the requirements. How do you like that? Well, you've made some unpopular things this year, but it looks like the CEO is safe for another 12 months. And there he is, little Sean, the CEO's son, bringing up the rear and uh, with the strategy director with him, who appears to have no sense of the Take the opportunity to look that up on your own sometime and watch it at real speed. But I, I think it's amazing to think sometimes um, we do act a little bit like sheep, you know what, as an entire field, as communities, as organizations, and we end up leading and, and following leaders who um, may have no sense of direction. <laughs> That was the final. I may have been one of those at one or more times in my life. <laughs> yeah. So we're hoping now to make this piece a little bit interactive. Um, and. what? Are, okay. This is a, a breakout piece, Sean. Oh, yeah. Okay. All right. So, uh, Teresa, can so, we get breakout room set up? Yep. So what we're going to do is just get in groups of two or three, and we just want you to talk quickly about what makes an effective leader, what makes an ineffective leader. And here's a question that happens in social work. Would you prefer to have a leader trained in social work in your agency or one trained in business and why? So maybe snap a picture of the slide with your phone uh, as you head off to breakouts. And we hope that you... Enjoy getting to know each other a little PDF better. The, yeah, we could uh, just a little slide, but except for the when they leave for the breakouts, I don't know if we can broadcast the picture. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Anyway, just five minutes, truly, and then we'll come back. Okay. Engage. Maybe just so. One second. Okay. They should be headed that way for five minutes. Okay. All right. Everybody's back, so go ahead. Wonderful. Welcome back. Great. Usually try to sing the Cotter um, theme song, but many of you kind of fun to watch these people pop was. back in and immediately turn the cameras off. <laughs> yeah, well, that's maybe good. I think it's a cultural <laughs> thing if I'm making the Zoom work. Anyway. Well, I don't have any thoughts about it. I thought it was kind of funny to watch. Uh, I hope you had rich conversations. I hope you enjoyed the peer-to-peer. -peer. That's always kind of fun. Um, we are looking for just responses. Um, and so if you want to put in the chat, what makes an effective leader? If you can like put a brief something, and then I'll ask a couple people to expound who would like to. Does everyone know where the chat is? Oh, wonderful. Thank Definitely. you, Shannon, for leading out. Okay. Okay. Wonderful. Okay. Um, let's see. Great. I'll read them out loud um, in case people are on their phones or somewhere hard to get to the chat. Adaptability, empowering employees, communication, listening and supporting, 
And uh, oh, that's awesome. If you have multiple people, that's great. Um, Owen oh, Jean, someone with a vision with the people skills, know your member skills. That's great. We discussed that the CSW being supervised needs to have access whenever needed and feel welcome to contact the supervisor. That's right. Accessibility plus regular weekly one-on-one. -on -one. And that's what we ask for for students too, isn't it, Sean, when we've got students? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, okay, let's move on to ineffective now. It is ineffective for leaders to always state their opinion before asking for their teams. Um, I, I hate that. <laughs> Yeah, like, well, here's what like I think. now everyone <laughs> feels really good about sharing their opinion now that we know the right answer, right? <laughs> okay, business and social work. Hi, Bonnie, that's great. Um, knowing their skills, supplementing deficiencies. All right, now let's do the fun part and talk about ineffective leaders. What do ineffective leaders do? Business. Social work no vision, constantly changing vision. Oh my goodness. If we have to do another five-year plan, right? That no one asks. <laughs> Tyrants. Now that is scary. We have, have a, a little history nice on that one, Jean. <laughs> cartoon in this. Micromanaging, all about the money. That is hard for social workers if you have a business-minded person. Mm -hmm. um, doesn't take responsibility for their mistakes. Welcome feedback without acting on it. Oh, right. <laughs> Ignore people. Um, they're not at fault. So not being accountable doesn't take responsibility. That is a theme, right? Dismissive, unavailable. Yeah, excellent. Okay. It's always interesting when we ask this question of people and you can hear that there's an undertone to some of the comments that you're like, yeah, there's a story there. <laughs> I know, and I would love to hear all the stories. Um, if anybody has a comment they'd like to make, just use the raise hand feature and, and we definitely, this is a lovely sized group for comments. Pretend they know things they don't. You know what I love to call that? Given the book report without reading the book, right? <laughs> When people haven't done their homework, you can kind of tell. Don't you remember in high school? I may or may not have done that on occasion, but get up and try to, you know, just give the whole report off the cliff notes or nothing. Okay. Or <laughs> so what would you, um, maybe this, you know, the I have to know my audience, but would you rather have a leader trained in social work or one trained in business and why? What are the pros of um what are the pros of a leader trained in social work? What are the pros of a leader trained trained in business? You're welcome to talk out loud if you want. Social work training and experience if they're right. If they're supervising um clinically easier to have a click uh-huh kind of a perspective thing right social work approach anybody think of a good reason to have someone trained in business okay cfo will focus on the business but a social worker is helpful for employee relations that's true the people skills Oh, this is a really great point, Stephanie. It comes down to the person more than the background. Um, on my experience with a mixed situation where I work. Yeah. Um, well, like we mentioned, you know, we were trained in clinical programs. Even my training as a PhD, trust me, had nothing to do with budgets unless it was writing a grant. But um, I don't, for a lot of us who went into social work, all that money stuff and accounting is not our thing, <laughs> but it's a really necessary part of keeping our services available and funded and all the things. So, yeah, Deanna. You know, it's interesting is that when I ended up in, in, you know, my first running the business kind of role, not just a single business advisory role, 
that I actually thought the business side of it would be the part that was the hardest for me. It was, I, I hated it, frankly, you know, the dollars and cents and the budget management and the, you know, all that, all that. I hate all of that, but it was a skill that was easy to, relatively easy to pick up. I actually struggle more with when to draw the boundaries, as Stephanie was talking about when we first came back out of breakouts, of where to draw the boundaries between when do I support and when do I say, okay, this is how it is. So I actually struggled more with managing my role in that sense than I did with keeping up with those things that were completely contrary to what I prefer and what I like about doing things. So, mm -hmm. so the interpersonal pieces. Yeah. All right, you're a little choppy, Sean. So, um, um, so next slide, please. Now that we've got that kind of in mind, and many of you really in your comments mentioned some of this, right? And I want you to be sure and look at this graphic. Maybe you've had that experience. Um, Maxim in 2014 identified five distinct typologies of leadership. And one is power, one's bureaucracy, one's inspiration, one's morality, and one's effective and ethical. And we're going to go through each one of these briefly and unpack them a little bit. Next slide. Okay, I am trying to, my computer is starting to have problems. So, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. I may have to leave my video off. I just try to turn it back on and it doesn't want to come back on. So. And you know what? Um, I can queue up and run the PowerPoint, Sean, if you feel like that's taxing your. Um, I don't know. Let's see how this works. Okay. So the first one in terms of talking about power uh, in leadership, um, I mean, we basically define power as what we need to initiate and sustain action. So it's the idea of taking what our intentions are and turning them into reality. Uh, and without the power, we really can't lead. Now, there's different types of power, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, but as a social worker, I don't love the idea of any of power and how power manifests in any relationship, in any context, because, of course, we I'm focused on, you know, I want everybody to feel like they are all, we all have shared power. But the reality is, is without power, we can't, we can't be in a leadership role. There's a certain element of power that goes along with that, no matter what we do. So where those sources of power come from, we have a lot of different ones, and we have legitimate power that's just hierarchically organized. This is the way that the, they have hired me to be in this position, and this position requires that I supervise or that I manage this piece of things or this part of things. And so that is just legitimate power that I was handed because of the, the reason I was chosen for the role and placed in that role. Um, there's reward power, that the power that we have based on our capacity to, to reward or punish other people. You know, um, Coercive power that uh, we can minimize opposition through coercion, whether that's uh, you know psychological or social, whatever that may be. I know I had a, a boss at one time who was quite a, a tyrant. I remember somebody put one of that, put that in the chat as one of the ineffective leaderships. And so he exerted a lot of coercive power simply by we all had to walk on eggshells and not make him angry because if we made him angry there would be hell to pay uh and so everyone was constantly had this low level sometimes high level of anxiety about navigating this guy uh because he yeah struggled with that is it lagging so badly that it's incoherent susan um it's it's just more at the distracting level so Let's okay. just switch and have me just if you can stop sharing. It's no big deal. It'll be quick. All right. Let's let's see if we do that really quick. My um uh, it can I have ordered a new computer from the university because I have been having problems. So okay. Okay, it told me that makes yeah. There you go. Okay. Okay. That'd be better. Yeah. I think so. Oh, I've got it. Okay. And let me go to slideshow. One second. 
We apologize for technical difficulties. Please stand by. <laughs> and we'll fly through these to where we were. Okay. Yes. Okay. All right. So we'll see back up when I wasn't quite done. Oh, that's right. Okay. <laughs> there you go. All right, so we have informational power that just whether whatever information that we have uh, in a clinical supervision role, that's kind of a big thing, um, a big piece of it. Um, but we in our expert power, we have charisma, you know, our personal characteristics that make people want to hear us or people want to respond to us in a positive way. So all of those different things come together in a way that creates a whole notion of what do we bring to bear in this situation? Where do we draw the power that we have in the leadership or administrative position? Because, you know, not to get all Spider-Man on you know, your comic, comic focus here, but with power comes responsibility, right? So how do we use that power and how are we paying attention to it? And I have found myself at various times slipping into using the power that I have based on my role in ways I don't feel that good about. Um, just in expediency or lack of attention, whatever. And so, those self checks for me have always been pretty powerful. On um, okay, Sean, that wasn't an okay way you handled that. You know, just because you're in charge doesn't mean you have to be a jerk about it. So, yeah. I think it's interesting to think about the parallel process between this and our more direct service work with clients, right? That when Sean mentioned self-awareness, very critical, professional use of self, um, all the things that, that we build skills for, for our work with clients. And sometimes when we become leaders, we might resort to other, other approaches because we're less comfortable. It's kind of like how no one wants to parent like their parents, <laughs> but without you know, increasing our knowledge and being very intentional and self-aware. Um, I would say sometimes we get into kind of fear-based leadership or feeling like we do need to maintain a level of power like that. And you're muted. All right, first day on Zoom. Um, so it looks like uh, I'm still having this lagging problem. So is the distraction, I need, I need to check, I apologize for this, is the distraction because of the lagging video? Because I can stop, I can just turn off the video and leave it off. And you're muted now, Susan. <laughs> Why don't you try that and see what happens? Okay, yeah, go back, go back one and we'll try that. Okay. Okay, so bureaucracy and leadership, is that working? I think so. Okay, so obviously when you're talking about organizations or agencies, there is a bureaucracy that we can't escape. Uh, and bureaucracies are by definition, like a chain of command, rational you know, principles, uh, and they're supposed to be efficient so that um, things flow more smoothly. If you've ever worked in a big bureaucracy, you know, I won't mention our current context, that it's not always the most efficient thing in the world, but the idea behind them is that it's supposed to be. That that's the reason that we have it is so that it makes for efficient uh, governing or you know leader leading, but it doesn't always work out that way. But um, and the important thing to remember is just because it's rational and it makes sense doesn't make it moral. We're going to say more about that a little bit later, or make it ethical, and that's sort of a piece of the ethics part we're going to be talking about. But um, because when we're talking about authority, we often sort of suspend our conscious. Well, this is what we were told to do. So we have this obligation that this is the expectation. And so we just do it and we sort of leave our moral judgment or our critical thinking. We just kind of leave it alone. We put it away. Um, and so when we get into that zone, if we're not careful, then we will do some things that we really shouldn't do. And I'm sure most of you are familiar with Milgram's experiments, um, administering shocks to people and lethal doses of shocks that these uh, research participants really believed that they were doing because they were being ordered to do so, and some of them did it. Um, and then the Zimbardo's prison experiment, you know, if you don't know those, you can certainly look them up. But the idea is that the more bureaucratic of a leadership style, organizational structure, whatever that you have, the more likely that you are going to create those kind of leadership, I guess, you know, people who just sort of follow along um, and 
in that kind of a setting, it basically means that one person with the most power determines the moral direction, and that can be quite dangerous. Um, and I think that's something that we have to be very careful to watch out for. Um, and even at a smaller level, I mean, I, I'm the clinical director now for a very small agency um, by choice. And they, um, even there, it can get the, 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 the difference between, well, this is what we have to do, but is it the right thing to do? It can sometimes get lost if we're not careful. So, and that's in a small agency. So I think it's important to always pay attention to those, that ethical side of things about how does that actually look in practice? How's it, how's it manifesting in reality? Awesome. Thank you. Um, so in terms of the next uh, tenant of this theory, inspirational leadership. And we can all think of leaders like this in social work, right? And in all kinds of arenas. Um, it's an emotional transaction between the leader and the led. And the inspirational leader captures hearts and minds and souls based on their passionate, clearly expressed strength of a conviction and often a particular worldview. And the downside of that uh, can be intolerance and can create, you know, such a feeling of being part of a cause that the cause um, is, is right, is, you know, and people can become emotionally aroused as individuals, as groups under the influence of a charismatic leader. And they can often engage in behavior that they would not otherwise engage in under ordinary circumstances. I mean, it would be interesting if we spent the rest of the time just thinking about historical examples of this um, internationally, basically. And I think we can look a little closer to home, you know, recent years, whatever opinions are, but of the things people will do in terms of following uh, a charismatic leader. And in the presence of this emotional arousal and response and passion, individuals may even often suspend critical thinking and moral judgment. That is so important organizationally because it goes back to the leadership example, right? Everyone's following. And sometimes it may be following someone with no sense of direction. And I think an important point, you know, sort of at underscore that, Susan, is that much like with bureaucratic leadership style, um, you have to be careful because you can actually end up with the same kind of problem from two completely different reasons, right? In a bureaucratic style, um, you can end up with uh, people making choices that really are not moral or ethical because they're being told to, and inspiration a leadership an inspirational leadership you can have the same problem manifest but it's because that the leader is so inspiring that they're inspiring them to make choices that are not moral or ethical but so you get the same outcome from coming from two totally different perspectives and reasons and that's really important that obviously any theoretical frame you know there aren't mutually exclusive situations always there there's complications there's complexity, there's crossover. So that's right. a great reminder. Thanks, Sean. And the reason um, I think it's important is because we all think inspirational leadership is great. That's what we want. But that can also go dark. Yeah. So the perspective of morality in leadership, and I think we also um, have to think of this in the ethical context that we have and work in, and also our social work values. Um, so according to Bennis and Manis, and this is older, 1996, kind of a classic thing, leadership is a creative and deeply human process that speaks of moral character, not charisma. So they would argue on this you know, point. Transformative leadership is defined as that occurrence where one or more persons engage with others in such a way that leaders and followers raise one another to higher levels of motivation and morality. So this is like, yeah, escalating things in a good way, making things more positive uh, in an environment. Transforming leadership ultimately becomes moral in that it raises the level of human conduct and ethical aspiration. So those checks and balances and bringing each other up, basically. 
of course, there's a flip side and we can think about historical situations and atrocious acts about against human time, <clears throat> excuse me, humankind that have been carried out in the name of, for example, religion, God, patriotism, all causes and situations that can be very positive and ha can have a very positive impact. But sometimes um, we end up with really negative and atrocious at times behavior. Leaders who claim the moral high ground can have enormous sway upon the lead. And the determination of moral requires critical thinking and the capacity to differentiate the symbols used to portray morality from the actual performance of moral acts themselves. Is that deep or what? <laughs> so, so, that's why we teach critical thinking in graduate school too, that sometimes we um, become part of a group or a cause or something. And then people really have to kind of reflect on, are we still having the high ground of motivation, morality, um, ethical, aspiration, human conduct that brings others up, that supports vulnerable people, that takes care of people in the way that our social work values would would help us understand. So, oh, nothing. And that can go back to our, uh, what we say about the land use statement, right? Mm -hmm. um, because it's, some, it's it, without action to back it up, without the moral acts in, in, involved, it's just a symbol. That portrays morality, but does it actually do anything? So that's why that's where we were sort of coming from with comment about that. Okay, so Sean um, has this final piece of the model. So of course, what we really want—I am trying to get my computer to behave, but it's still giving me trouble—is um, this idea that we are doing both effective and ethical leadership. Um, so Kellerman said that we came up with this four by four typology that you know basically saying good leadership is effective and ethical, and bad leadership can be ethical, ethical but not effective, or effective but not ethical, or effectively unethical, <laughs> which is a bit of a word salad, right? But um, so what we kind of suggest and talk about is just let's just ditch the idea of good. And everyone else they don't have the same moral weight oh, and don't we miss the same kind of after let's just ditch the idea <laughs> sorry oh you lost me for just a moment but you're back oh, my goodness i apologize people for the problems with my um computer here um so i was saying that um much like in clinical work where i teach my supervisees and my students that try to stay away from words like good and bad because of the moral weight and implications of those words uh, letting that go and talking instead about what's effective leadership, what's ethical leadership. So when we're talking about effective, we basically mean this idea that um, how we're having, explicating our vision and making it real in the real world and how it's manifesting out um, in our work. Uh, and that the ethical part of that is, well, is this good for the whole of society? You know, could it be good for our clients and not good for society potentially? But the idea is looking at the whole picture, is this a good thing for the world? Are we bringing good things into the world through the way that we're leading and the way that we're managing the work that we do? So where ethical effective leadership is kind of about the how we do this, you know, does it work? Is it effective? Is it accomplishing our goals? Ethical is about what is it bringing to the world? What differences is it making in the lives of people that we are in interacting with and impacting and trying to help? So truthfully, if you want to do this, they really cannot be separated. So to be an effective and ethical leader, you have to consider all of these things, because frankly, I have been effective at times and questionably ethical. I'll, I'll own that. And but the, more often I've been highly ethical, but less effective, which does go all the way back to what um, I think I'm not picking on you, Stephanie, but you made a really good comment uh, about the idea that uh, knowing where to set the boundaries, you know, so you may be being very ethical, but you're not effective if you're not doing that well. So balancing those things out is really critical in terms of effective and ethical leadership. Awesome. 
On to poor leadership. So we, you know, we, we talked a little bit about poor leadership. So what, what creates that? Does anybody really go into becoming administrators or leaders or supervisors hoping to do a bad job? You know, uh, I mean, I, I, I would hope not, but I guess it's always possible. But what creates those people and puts people into this position where they are being poor leaders are some of these different things that there's a need for power, right? For whatever reason, if you like the power, you like the control, being able to manipulate other people, um, then that can lead you into a very difficult place and, and where that, you know, you're sort of disabling your moral judgment because you're needing whatever you need to do to make yourself to satisfy that need for power uh, and whatever that looks like. I, I frequently told um, everybody that I know that uh, I like when it comes to politicians, for example, the reluctant ones that go into office are the ones that get my interest. You know, Susan, at the risk of disclosing too much, I know that you would never sought the position that you are in for the university, um, which actually is what makes you really good at it, I think, um, because you didn't want it in the first place, but you stepped into a role that was a need. Um, so it wasn't a seeking of power, it was a trying to fill a, fill a gap. And I think that's how a lot of us end up in leadership. And that probably makes us much more effective leaders. It certainly makes us leaders who um, I think people are more willing to follow and willing to understand because you're not actively seeking that power. There can also be the need for affiliation that people are looking for. Um, I want to be liked. You know, I don't want to be in control, but but am I, if I go into this role that people will like me and that can lead us to making really poor decisions. And I have definitely struggled with this one over my career. Uh, it's not so much that I need to be liked, but that I don't like to upset people. I don't enjoy conflict. I want people to feel good. I'm a very affirmative person in general. And so I have had struggles occasionally with not setting the right kind of boundaries, not you know saying this is how it is when it needs to be done. Um, because I don't want to upset people. And so that, that was my, one of my biggest struggles early on in my career. Uh, greed, you know, leadership can certainly be motivated by greed. Uh, we want more of this, more of that, you know, uh, greater status, whatever the case may be. Um, and then honestly, just simple incompetence, and I'm probably going to go through this myself, uh, is that you just take on responsibilities that you are not appropriately qualified or skilled. So you're ineffective. Just no matter how well intended you are, and this was my first leadership position, fell into this absolutely perfectly because, without going into detail in the interest of time, uh, basically Georgia changed their licensing laws, uh, and agencies all over Georgia, Triple Plus Grade, just kind of started freaking out. Um, and my clinical director quit at my agency where I was only a year in out of fresh out of graduate school because she said the standards were impossible. And so the executive director handed all those standards out and said, does anybody think they could do this? And I said, well, I didn't ask to do it. I said, because I had been in a, a different setting that was very rigid. And I said, I think this is doable. You know, it just takes a lot of shifting our the think, way we think about it. And he said, good, you're promoted right on the spot. And I was like, are you joking? <laughs> so it was a very difficult thing. And I really had good intentions, but oh, did I make mistakes? Um, and was very ineffective for a while until I got figured out what I was doing, which took a while. So yeah, that's in, but so in, incompetence isn't because someone's stupid or, you know, or doesn't care. Uh, sometimes it's because they don't have the skill set yet, which is what we try to do for our students with some of this material that we do in our classes is preparing them for if you wind up in that role, whether you would intend to or not, you'll have some basic skill level and, and so you won't struggle with that ineffectiveness and incompetence. So at least they'll know where to look, right? Yeah. And that there are theories of leadership and supervision, just like there are theories of practice. Um, so some of the basic theories of leadership, uh, if we had more time, we have another like conversation that we do in a, in a longer session that is more like, um, are good leaders born or made? Nature versus nurture, really. Age old dilemma. But, and so here are a few. The great person theory says leaders are born. People are just born to lead. They just need to find their spot. Clearly, you know, that happens in more um, kind of inherited monarchy roles. <laughs> the great event, events and availability of followers make leaders out of ordinary people. I think we can well, see that. That's the plot of so many movies, isn't it? 
<laughs> I know I was just thinking of like Martin Luther King Jr. and all of that where someone just kind of rises to the top because someone is needed. The crucible, leaders are formed through some confluence of forces that meld characters, some turning point for them. The trait theory, personal characteristics create effective leaders. The efficient leader or manager, time and motion studies that have been done, science informs leadership. The humanist leader or manager, human relations and sensitivity model, employees work best when their emotional needs are taken into account. So this is, you know, just like everything, like I said, things are a little more complex than picking one or two of these even to, to think about how a leader comes in to power, if you will, and and how um, how that plays out for them. And it kind of informs helping us identify new leaders and nurture that, but also nurture that in ourselves. Okay, I love this graphic. So I'm just gonna dwell on it for a quick minute. Um, organizationally, it is so fascinating um, to think about like delivering a product, if you really will. My product is currently graduate education. It's my social work practice and has been for a few years. But sometimes, and, and when I worked more in child welfare in the foster care and adoption situation, I would drive around the state and we would try to create programming to support parents, children, but also professionals who serve them. And it's interesting um, to think about how every different person, you know, this could be like a product. We're not designing a, a swing or a shoe or something. We're designing programs. We're designing, you know, on higher levels, policy and other things that really impact it. But if you look at how just perspective on everything and and eventually, hopefully everyone um, gets some input and we can identify what the customer or our clients or our employees really needed uh, without going to all this lack of cohesive, you know, thinking and misdirected design, basically. We, we spent this semester doing quite a bit of policy analysis in our classes. And we talked about the Chafee Act last week um, that has to do with kids aging out of foster care, all wonderful intent behind that policy. But um, when you look at it and kids aging out of care's struggle with using those resources for a number of reasons that create barriers, um, I'm not sure we knew what the customer really needed. So we have directive styles, um, and that is assuming personal responsibility for making major decisions and acting as a taskmaster often to ensure that things get done. These are our take charge leaders. Maybe you recognize that in yourself. Maybe you recognize that in, you know, administrators or bosses that you've had. Um, and then there's participative, retain final decision-making authority but seek ideas, inspiration, and feedback from employees. And now the chat that we had earlier is just flashing through my mind because some people, that example that was given, like an ineffective leader, you know, seeks ideas and inspiration and feedback from employees, but then bait and switch, I'm directive. And I'm going to tell you exactly what's going to happen here. <laughs> so isn't that interesting? I hope that you're thinking about um, those examples as we go through these theories. Um, Not to get political, Susan, but that reminds me of the U dot and the big the gondola in in the Cottonwoods, right? It's like, tell us what you think. Well, here's what we're doing anyway. You know, yeah. So yeah. <laughs> Thank you for your feedback. Now step aside. Yeah. Yeah. It's, not our um, way, yeah. <laughs> it's very disempowering and very disillusioning as an employee or a supervisee or anything 
in that situation, right? Are you going to show up the next time for the focus group to give your suggestions? I don't necessarily think so. So um, a delegative leader assigns decision-making responsibilities to staff based on their skills, abilities, and qualification. How do you say that? Delegative? Delegate? I don't know. Delegative, anyway. I think. Delegative. However okay. you want to say. We'll ask Google later because they know everything. Okay. Um, anyway, you know what? Okay, let's think about this. If we're assigning decision-making responsibilities based on skills, abilities, and qualification, that says a lot about, and I'm always go to the five competencies of the Council on Social Work Education, um, competencies five through nine, that says a lot about engaging your employees, your supervisees, and, and assessing um, what their skills, abilities, and qualifications are, right? before you can intervene and assign their responsibilities based on those things. And also finally, evaluating, constantly assessing, is this a good fit for this employee? Do we always get to have a perfect fit between what we're asked to do and what our skills are? No. Sean and I have both taught across the entire curriculum of social work program. And I tell you what, sometimes we've stood on solid ground and sometimes it's like smoke and mirrors, you know, good things. Someone wrote a book on this, but so it's sure gotten that better. For your students, we apologize. <laughs> <laughs> it's gotten better over time, but um, there were, especially in the early days, right, of being an educator. To, to stand up and I never was able to take that directive approach because I, I mean, if, if you take the directive approach, you really better um, like know your stuff <laughs> if you're wanting that kind of uh, approach. <coughs> okay, Sean. So some of the things too that we, you know, there's, there's a, I forget what we got this, I forgot to drop the reference in. But uh, there is there are these challenges to leadership and sort of typologies of people that you know that manifest these traits. But you have the oblivious that just assume that people know what they're doing that they should be doing, um, and so they can their follow up, the monitoring, the sort of checking in to make sure things are going the way they're going are sort of afterthoughts at best and often non non existent. Um, you have the misleader that gives mis mixed or incorrect messages, so. You end up with staff never really knowing exactly what we're supposed to do. I mean, you know, what are we supposed to do with this? How do we respond? Uh, there's the insulter, which really goes back to that really authoritarian boss that I had with fresh out of graduate school uh, that humiliates or puts down employees, um, not always in an overt manner. Um, sometimes the code word is more difficult, actually, I think. Um, but they belittle other people often just to justify their own sense of superiority or their own need for power. Uh, but it's shocking to me how many of these type of people rise to leadership positions and how many I've encountered in the professional world and the academic world uh, that have just risen to power. And I just keep thinking, how? How does someone who puts other people down on a regular basis wind up in these kind of roles? And if you know that, let me know because I've never figured it out. Um, the micromanager uh, speaks for itself. Arrogant, you know, exaggerated pride, self-importance. I never admit, somebody mentioned in the chat earlier, I never, not admitting mistakes and not accepting accountability for their mistakes. Um, the narcissist, which crosses the line between client and boss, right? But, uh, or staff that are, instru are instrumental to the manager's self-gratification or the self-aggrandizement. So it doesn't really matter what you're doing as long as you're feeding the ego of the person in charge. Um, the loner, someone who closed door managers, never consult, never interact, never talk to other people, just kind of keeps to themselves. Uh, and then the charmer, which is those people who seek personal acceptance, their popularity is important to them. And they're often very popular. They're often liked very well, but they're not particularly effective because it's more about getting people to respond positively to them than it is about actually doing a good job of what they're doing. So just some ideas and thoughts about the different types of ways you see this these four leadership qualities, these challenges in leadership are manifesting in different people in different contexts. So we want to do a little exercise around these two ideas, this, these 
different kind of leadership roles and then the um the idea of leadership challenges so yeah so one thing we want to say we work with students um who are graduates our field is in such dire need of professionals most organizations have openings are in search of you know people to serve the vulnerable populations that they they treat or serve and so one thing we teach uh, as the career guidance piece of our role or advising is for our graduates to look for good supervision and so I just think that's important. If you're coming to a workshop and you want to learn about supervision, um, just know that it is a very competitive market right now for our graduates and, and all licensed clinicians, especially, I think. And, and they're actively looking for and assessing for what kind of support, what kind of leadership, what kind of culture the organization that they will choose to work for is, is about, right? So we're um, going to go ahead and do breakout groups again. Um, and Teresa, we can keep the same ones for these. But we just want you to think about your own approach to leadership. Um, and in your breakout groups, think about the following. What is your predominant default style of leadership? You can be as vulnerable as you want. If you if you just want to be, yeah, or not, um, or or just think about other people. So that's why we have the second question. What leadership challenges have you observed or experienced in others? And of these challenges, which would be the, or has been the most difficult to experience? We actually need to launch our poll right now, Sean, which is anonymous. <laughs> yes. So we are curious. Um, the first part of this, that, just uh, just tell us in a quick quick poll. What is the, what do you see as your default style of leadership? Directive, participative, delegative, and it is a forced choice, so you can't select all three. <laughs> your primary. Well, we, that we all have mixes of different styles, so it's not necessarily that easy to pin down. But in general, what's your predominant approach? So, yeah, it looks like maybe we don't have as much time to do the whole work breakout so let's just um yeah, let's maybe put some off. things in the chat um, again so I okay see that. let's see with this audience i'm not remotely surprised by this result <laughs> <laughs> okay there's some you good know, data. To explore, Susan. i know that we do not but it would be very we fascinating don't. to find out contextually how much of this like for people who are identifying as directive is that required contextually or, you know, because of where you are and the work that you're doing, or is this something that is just your general preferred style? That would be very mm -hmm. interesting to find out, but we don't have time, so. Awesome. Okay, thank you for participating in our poll. That is fun. Um, and hopefully everyone can see those results out there. Uh, we just want, can we just take like three examples, Sean, if people want to raise their hands? Um, sure of folks who might, let's go back to that other one, um, who might have seen some of these. Does anybody have an example of an oblivious, a misleader, an insulter, boss or leader that they have known? Would like to share with the group. Anyone? No names, please. <laughs> oh yeah no names and no organizations okay micromanager candace can you share more out loud that would be great non-identifying everybody's going to be scared to speak out sorry no um it just made it harder to do our job because it feels like you know they were always just micromanaging and so it just made it harder to um show up in an authentic way mm -hmm. because we always had that you know them watching over our shoulder mm -hmm. okay yeah. great example anyone else i talked about my insulter 
Calista has an oblivious. You know, and sometimes in social work, we end up with a charmer, right? We want popularity. We don't want to hurt people's feelings. It's actually a struggle that we have in the field. I think it's the same for professors, but sometimes that's ineffective and doesn't help people build their competence and doesn't help your organization. Um, yeah. One of the most powerful things that was said to me in this in this kind of in, in this role range is in that early job that I have talked about where I was just I felt like I did so poorly because I didn't know what I was doing. And one of the staff said to me, she said, you know, you're extremely likable, but I don't think you're very good at this. And so it hurts. But I, I didn't respond defensively. I, I said, you know, I said, that's kind of that's that kind of hurts. But I want to know what you're seeing, because if it's true, I want to work on it. And she gave me some pretty good feedback. Um, it was very hurtful at the time, but it was completely true. Um, and I realized I at that time I had been much more focused on trying to make keep people like feeling good about the role I was in, particularly since some of them have been there for a few years and then I came in brand new and suddenly I'm with a ball, you know, I'm over them. That was hard. Um, and um, rather than making sure that we did things effectively. So I just thought that was very powerful feedback for me. It, it was a turning point for me in terms of being in administrative type positions. Uh, and I'm forever grateful for that person for actually saying that to me because it made me stop and self-reflect. So I'd gotten in the zone and was kind of rolling, right? And so it was like, oh, yeah. Oh, that's very true, Mark. What people who show multiple traits depending on the audiences. Yeah, you see that quite a bit. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, in terms of uh, what, what are, you know, some research on what are effective leadership in human service organizations. So Brody uh, suggests that, competence, that competencies of effective HSO administrators include the ability to articulate a future orientation, be a social entrepreneur, uh, treating staff with dignity, uh, communicating significant messages, engendering trust, uh, inspiring people to perform better and to, you know, to reach those those goals, uh, whatever they may be for the agency. High levels of emotional intelligence, which includes self-awareness, self-regulation, personal motivation, empathy, effective social skills. All of those things that we look at as social workers and think, this is what we want to manifest. This is who we want to be. This is what we value. So it fits really well in line. Again, I think as long as we stay self-reflective and focused. You're mute, Susan. You did. <laughs> <laughs> so I think we've already talked something. about a lot of these, okay? Um, some, so we want to be ethical and effective leaders. That's kind of, it's not hierarchical. All might work in given situations, but that's kind of what's consistent with our social work values. Um, we need to be able to understand organizations, apply our social work competencies to engaging, assessing, intervening, and evaluating ongoing um, organizations. We need to be able to facilitate communication. Those are the skills that we are good at. Sometimes it's difficult when it feels more like our peers than maybe a family that we're working with clinically. We need to uh, express cultural sensitivity. Um, it's interesting. If we have diversity in our organizations, let's always be asking those folks from vulnerable populations who are working with us, do you feel safe here? Do you feel safe? Don't assume that you're taking care of everyone and that everything is going well. That's an important question to constantly ask and take action if there's a lack of safety for anyone. Um, championing change. For a social worker, the main goal is to continually improve. That's that ongoing evaluation process. And, and to have that moral courage to, to use strategies that empower our clients and empower our employees, right? And empower ourselves in positive, effective use of our power as leaders. Um, in terms of administration, we want, and now we're gonna kind of move toward clinical, right? As we finish up, um, we wanna help supervisees meet organizational and or agency requirements, expectations, standards, compliance. We are gatekeepers of the field. So it can't just be warm hugs and you're awesome. 
sometimes we have to be able to give feedback. We have to ensure that those folks are following agency policies and procedures, that they see the vision and importance of those things and related compliance issues because our, our business license, our professional license to practice depends on it. Um, all of those that we need to serve, uh, standards of care, all the contractors, all the, you know, all of it, HIPAA, on and on. Um, all performance appraisal procedures and formats and management or administration focus risk and liability, whether that's vicarious or direct. And as we support students in practicum settings, we think about this a lot. We want to guide our students in strong ways so that we don't have situations that put them at risk, the agencies are with at risk, ourselves at risk, to be honest. And then on the clinical side of that, and by the way, in terms of liability, one thing I get from my staff a lot is you're so liability focused. It's always about liability with you, but I will continue to stand on my record that no client, student, or staff member, to the best of my knowledge, has ever or, or has ever gotten into any kind of legal trouble or ethical trouble over their actions or choices. So anyway, so clinical supervision, um, so when we're talking about clinical supervision, we're not just instructing our supervisees, but we're also trying to teach them and we model and we show the competencies in our, in our practice. And so that we're trying to display what we're actually trying to teach and trying to help our supervisees understand. So we have to look at evaluating clinical interactions, right? In all these different situations and contexts and different manifestations and capacities. We wanna look at what are, what are supervisees doing what are, that's effective and then we want to identify that specifically because a lot of times they don't know. I mean, a lot of times I don't know. Like you know, somebody say, "Oh, you did that really well, really." You know, and I and I have to explore that because I didn't think I did or I didn't really notice that I did. Uh, and then reinforcing that, um, looking at problematic or ineffective treatment, um, and then correcting those, improving those in a very supportive way that's evidence based, um, but demonstrates and demonstrates respect for the person that we're supervising. Uh, teaching, demonstrating counseling techniques. Um, Looking at the reasons why we're choosing the interventions that we're using, and are they tied to something real? You know, so when we look at what the work that a clinician may be doing with a client, what does that look like and where did that come from? I frequently ask that question in supervision. It's like, where is that coming from? It sounds great. Where's it coming from? I'm just curious. Uh, and seeing if they have it, if it's tied to something real, something legitimate. Um, looking at significant events and helping our the people that we supervise figure out what was going on there and what really happened and what were any missed opportunities or whatever, or what were any really great moments in that moment. Um, and challenging them, but in a productive way, constructive manner in which they're growing and learning from that. Uh, and identifying, in, as I said earlier, reducing liability, whether that's vicarious or direct. Um, I think it's really important to try to make sure that people don't put themselves in situations where they could find themselves in trouble. Mute. <laughs> this is like the worst day I've ever had with muteness. Okay. Um, You're working off a laptop too instead of a full screen. I know, computer. and I'm running a little PowerPoint. So core tests, as we're thinking about our effectiveness in leadership and especially in clinical supervision, I just love this cartoon. I have like all these feelings kind of about generational issues right now, and I am trying to navigate them. Um, this cartoon cracks me up. I'm looking for a mentor who can help me become excellent at my job without boring me with a lot of advice. <laughs> so I just, I find that fascinating. As we think about it, think about the ways that we're supervising. Does it grow the supervisee and the supervisor? Does it encourage and ensure conformity to all those policies, standards, expectations, things we talked about? Does it ultimately, this is huge result in improved client outcomes. That is why we're in this field. That is why we're funded to provide these services, improve lives. Does it provide both support and challenge to the supervisee? Does it help make the work more manageable, like a positive work environment for productivity and quality outcomes? And we all know retention during this time of many choices of where to work. The four A's of effective supervision available, and we saw some of these in the chat, 
awesome, open, receptive, trusting, not threatening person to approach, right? Accessible, easy to approach, speak freely with, able, someone who has real knowledge and skills to transmit, and affable, just pleasant, friendly, reassuring, someone who's emotionally regulated and there for you, I think is what's important. And we share this information with our students who are getting ready to graduate and say, when you're looking for positions and you're preparing for supervision, look for these things. You know, ask these questions, look for these things in supervisors. Um, so some of the challenges that we have in this, of course, is their time. You know, there's never enough time to do anything. They're going back to that cartoon about dying and being buried in paperwork. Yeah, I kind of live that. <laughs> and so there just never seems to be a ton of time and to get everything done. Is there enough training? Are you getting enough training as your supervisee? One thing that we frequently do in lead as leadership and social work is that we are great at taking care of our employees and our staff and our supervisees, but are we taking care of ourselves? You know, um, so be careful not to let your self-care, this is not in here, I just had a thought, uh, go to the wayside when you're being so concerned about the self-care of, of your supervisees. Make sure that you keep yourself in there as well. Uh, rewards, uh, can you really reward positive practice and conformity to these to these standards? Uh, and how can you do that? What will that look like? Um, peers, um, you know, are there colleagues that you have that you can turn to? Um, and that should say model, maybe you'll see rather model from career, peer administrator, supervisor. So are there people that you can consult with? Because frequently in leadership or clinical supervision roles, we don't have a supervisor to speak of, not clinically anyway. And so do you have a team of people that you reach out to? Uh, there are some people in this room or this group of people here that I have called for consultation before. So uh, there are people that I can call consistently and regularly to say, I'm not sure what to do with this. So I encourage my, my supervisees to do that, but I also encourage myself to do it uh, just to keep me sane and focused and not to wrap that. Yeah, thanks, Teresa. Uh, so uh, focus where to look at our part, projects and energies, Agency balancing the need, that balancing the needs of the organization with the supervisor's needs and with that of your own, and then in a per, interpersonal, keeping your own stuff in check, you know, watching your own stress and the way that that sort of manifests in real life, and then you know, be careful that you're not doing lip service. Well, I'm always available, but then you're not, or you can reach out to me anytime, but then you don't respond over your actual practice. That seems to be a thing for us today, Susan, is that whole idea of lip service versus actual practice. <laughs> well, and I want to say lip service around self-care. Something that's beginning to be studied organizationally is even corporations that have self-care rooms and zen rooms and chill out rooms. But then uh, if you look at this cartoon, you, you're experiencing that and no amount of self-care accommodation is going to make up for a really scary <laughs> boss, right? Okay, we have these little vignettes. Um, and Sean, you can just, we can read them. We, we don't have time to go through them like in breakout groups, which is so fun, but you've all had these situations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we used to, um, we do this in classes. We do it as a role play where we have a supervisor, supervisee. Um, and these are all from things that came out of my actual practice. And so the barbecue supervisor is a employee who attended a barbecue at a client's home. Uh, and you have to explain to the employee why that wasn't okay. Uh, this is a clinical context. Uh, you know, the, a, we have a, a supervisee with uh, body odor challenges that are pretty significant and that people have noticed and complained and having to meet with that person and discuss that and bring it, that's a very difficult one. Um, and I, that one's the one that gives our students the most challenges, I think, whenever we use it as a role play. Um, there's one more and you feel free to add, to the chat, your uncomfortable situation. I mean, yeah. these are real. You can't make this stuff up. This is what yeah, sometimes we're asked to do. Company client, someone who supervises, someone that continue to. This is a real example. I'll just share the quick context. From my agency, we have a rule of three. You can never be alone with a client, particularly outside of the agency. Uh, and this one clinician did that several times. And after the third warning, I gave him the option of stepping down or being fired. Um, because that it was a liability concern and it, we, we worked with sexually reactive kids. We had a lot of um, kids that had come out of uh, uh, child trafficking situations in Atlanta. So it was a struggle and he kept violating it and did that very dangerous thing of this client would never, you know, say anything or never accuse me of anything. And so we finally let him go. 
Uh, and then passive aggressive attitude, uh, a person who is very passive aggressive uh, with uh, staff and clients, um, but then doesn't seem to have much self-awareness around it. So um, anyway, just th th things to think about and what that would be like if you haven't had to face anything like this or have those kind of challenging conversations, what they would be like when you did, if you did have to do that. So. So we're going to wrap up here. Oh, well, we don't have enough time, unfortunately. So. Yeah. Um, so think about those situations, and I'm sure you've got plenty of examples of, of things that you have to approach. Um, there's actually a lot of models for giving feedback and receiving feedback, creating culture of openness and transparency without being, you know, attacking and disempowering. Um, anyway, here's our contact information. Those are both of our mobile phones. You can text or call or email is sometimes best because we're sitting down and not on the fly. But thank you for being here. It's been fun. I know I'm walking, but I had to like turn back on just to say goodbye. <laughs> well, thank you both for providing this training today. It was very informative. I know I learned some things today that I think I can apply uh, to my own work. Um, but to close out this session, I have added the feedback survey link to the chat. Um, if anybody would like to do that immediately following this session, they are more than welcome to do that. Um, as a reminder, you do have to complete that in order to receive your continuing education credits. And if you do complete that, you'll get your certificate within two weeks. Um, we also uh, hold these uh, sessions every single month. Next month, it will be on August 11th, so it's a different day than usual. Um, we usually hold on the third Friday, and that's the second Friday. But um, hopefully you will be able to join us for that. I'm just adding the registration link to that in the chat. That will be focused on grief, death, and dying and be presented by Shannon Rhodes. Um, so please join us for that session. If you have any questions regarding um, this session, you're more than welcome to stay on the call um, to ask that uh, Sean and Susan any follow up questions. Um, but to close out, I will post the social media codes for both the Transforming Communities Institute and USU Social Work because this is done in collaboration with the Social Work Department. Um, and for the recording of this session, it will be found on YouTube. Um, within two weeks. So other than that, if you don't have any questions, feel free to go about your day, but we thank you all for coming and, and joining us.